Okay. I think with that we can basically get started. Uh, hi everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Martin. I'm an Android engineer at Outsoft and an Android Kotlin tech editor for Ravenderlick.com. And today we're going to do something different. So we've just uh, seen a keynote which was about idiomatic Kotlin and talks and articles and resources like this are of course very important for all of us to grow together as a community to write better Kotlin code overall for everyone. Uh, but we've already had that talk today, so we're going to do something else. So with that, welcome to Idiotic Kotlin, where we're going to look at some ways of misusing the language. Uh, I have to put up a disclaimer, uh, because Marcin didn't like uh, my practice run yesterday without it. So I'm not saying that you should do these things that I'm going to show you. I'm saying that you can do these things. Uh, with the, within the confines of the language. So, uh, let's get started. Our first section is going to be all about executing code in interesting ways and operations. And whenever you write code, its shape generally looks something like this, right? So, uh, it's a series of instructions. We call various functions. We understand that these will execute some code for us. But what if we could uh, reshape this code and have something like this here instead. So what if instead of calling functions such as move forward, we could do things like uh, just say forward, left, forward. Doesn't it feel very succinct and like to the point? So um, we need a bit of background for this. Um, we have to go back to Java for a moment. In Java, you can't write down lines like this. Uh, the language doesn't allow you to write down, for example, 2 plus 3 on a single line, because that's, that's just not a valid statement in Java land. Uh, you need to assign it to a variable, you need to call a function with it, you need to use the value somehow. Uh, same goes for, for example, a single string. However, in Kotlin, you are allowed to do anything uh, on a line, almost. So you can write down just a single expression, and that's a valid line of code in Kotlin. Uh, semantically, what happens here is that the value will be computed and then thrown away. If it's so trivial, uh, like this example, if you compile it and look at the bytecode, you'll probably end up with a empty function because the compiler will optimize this away for you, but you can do this at the source level for sure. So with that, if we go back to the code that we are trying to implement, let's say that we have our original functions which were performing some functionality and we're uh, going to introduce some new properties, all of which are going to return unit. So uh, they have this meaningless return value that we are not going to use in any way. However, uh, if we write down the name of these properties, their values will be read, which means that their getters will execute, and we can just call the original functions inside those getters. So we've achieved this new syntax like this. Uh, what else could we do with this example? Well, what if we could uh, place these comments into strings? Uh, can we do this? So for uh, us to execute some code in here, uh, we would need to somehow track the string creations. So we would have to run some code when the string constructor is being run, uh, which is quite difficult. You could attempt to uh, instrument your runtime and track these allocations. Uh, but since the compiler will optimize these away for you at compile time, uh, that's not going to work at runtime, unfortunately, and it's also very hacky. But if you allow us to just change the syntax a little bit, uh, introduce these small minus signs in the front of the line, then we sort of has, have these series of steps that we are trying to per perform. And this minus sign, of course, is a valid operator in Kotlin. Uh, we use it every time we write down a negative number. Uh, again, semantically, this is a positive number with the minus operator being applied to it. And we can uh, define this same minus operator for a string as well as an extension function. So the name of the operator would be unary minus. And all we need to do in the body of this operator is check what the value of this string is. And then again, call into the original implementations. Uh, for our next example, uh, we're going to talk about factorials a bit. Um, just to recap what a factorial is, although I'm going to assume that most of you already uh, know this, uh, 
for any positive number n, the factorial of that number is denoted with n exclamation point, and it's the product of numbers from 1 up to uh, that number n. So take, for example, 3, it would be 1 times 2 times 3, which is 6, and so on and so on. And if you want to implement this in Kotlin, you can do it in a whole bunch of different ways. You can do it imperatively. You can uh, write a recursion that will calculate this for you. And you can, for example, do it in a functional way, which is one of my favorite solutions in uh, this case. So what you could do is uh, take a range from 1 to n and fold over that range. So you start with a value of 1. And as you're going through the values in the range, you keep multiplying whatever you had so far with the current value uh, from the range, which gives you exactly the product of all of these numbers, so the factorial that we are looking for. And I've defined this function as an extension on int, so the way that you would call it is by saying 6.factorial, so this would give you, for example, 720. But uh, this isn't really the syntax uh, that we are looking for here. Uh, what we really want to do is use the original mathematical notation for factorials, which would uh, have to look like this. So we would need an operator that's a exclamation point, and, and it comes after a number. Unfortunately, we don't have this operator in Kotlin. Uh, we can only do something that's sort of similar to it if you allow me to just switch these two characters around. So this now is an operator that exists, and you use it every day in your Kotlin code whenever you invert the value of a boolean. So uh, this is the not operator, which we can again define as an extension on any type if we really want to, for example on an int, and then we can just call into the factorial function and use this to produce a factorial value. Uh, this, by the way, uh, as you can see uh, from the link on the bottom of the slide, is from the effective Kotlin book, in fact. Uh, which I have to tell you at this point recommends that you not use the not operator like this. Um, moving on, uh, this again is sourced from a blog post by Todd Ginsberg. Uh, so this is the regular syntax of generating random numbers in Kotlin. You can go random.nextint and give an upper bound uh, for the number that you want. However, uh, Todd came up with a much better syntax uh, he was doing this shrug. <laughs> he was uh, doing this shrug on an integer and using this to uh, produce a random number. Uh, this is straightforward enough to implement, actually. Uh, so this again is an extension on int, and all you need to do inside the extension is call the original random implementation, right? And uh, what allows you to uh, use this shrug syntax is the backticks in the function name. So if you have any identifier in the language, uh, whether it's a function name or a variable name or a property name, you can place it in backticks and use all sorts of special characters inside it. Uh, you can even put, back, uh, put uh, white space in there and things like that. Uh, one thing that you can't do put in there is uh, forward and backward slashes, interestingly, uh, which are normally used for the arms of this uh, emoticon. Uh, so if you want to find out what those weird characters are that look like slashes, you can go to the original blog post uh, that describes this. Uh, Todd's implementation was actually uh, even neater than that. Uh, he was using this code, uh, which even takes the source of randomness as a parameter, an optional parameter. Uh, so if you wanted to shrug uh, with a um, thread local random or a secure random implementation, that you, then you could certainly do that as well. And um, so I was looking at this, and I figured that most of the time I'm fine with the default implementation, so what if I never want to use that parameter? Well, uh, if I don't need that parameter, then I can clean up the syntax of this call by removing the parentheses that are at the end of this operation. And all I need to do to make this work is convert the extension function into an extension property and place this inside its getter. And then my next idea was that when I'm generating a random number, uh, a lot of the times I want to uh, give it both bounds, not just the upper one, but the lower bound as well. So uh, I figured that if I want to generate a random number between two values, I might as well just shrug between those two values like this and use that to uh, generate a random number. Uh, 
And this, again, is quite easy to implement in Kotlin. We are still using backticks, we are still using extensions, but the new feature that we're using here is the infix keyword, which lets you write down the name of a function between its receiver and parameter, and uh, then and, uh, call, it, call the function without the conventional dot and parentheses syntax. Okay, so that's it for our first section. We're gonna move on to spam. Uh, this section is going to contain things that you can uh, put in your code base, which will look like they do something, but in reality, it will turn out that none of them do anything. Uh, but they will be very confusing for anyone else who wants to work in your code base. So this is basically a good way to guarantee your own job security. Uh, so, for our first example, uh, let's take this function. Uh, it looks complicated at first. It's doing something with a uh, list of values. It's looping over them and so on and so forth. What we're really interested in here are uh, these statements. So, at the end of the function, there's this very boring uh, return statement, which obviously just returns from the function. But in the middle of it, uh, we have these two throw return statements. So, does anyone already happen to know uh, what this code will do? Okay, one person in the front row. Anyone else? Okay, so, in order to explain this, uh, we're gonna have to look at the Kotlin type hierarchy for a moment, which looks something like this, right? So, uh, I hope that most of you will uh, already know that there is this special type any in Kotlin, which is at the very top of the hierarchy, and it's the super type for everything else. It's much like a Java Lang object in uh, Java terms, so everything sort of inherits from any. However, there's also another uh, very similar type, which is at the bottom of the hierarchy, which is called nothing. So nothing is a bottom type in Kotlin, meaning that it it's a subtype of every other type in the language. Uh, this seems very weird at first, uh, because we don't even have multiple inheritance, so how could there be a class that extends all other classes? And if it's a built-in class, how can it extend the class that I myself define in code uh, after, after the like, language was created, essentially? Uh, so this is a complicated topic. The real key behind how nothing works is that uh, it doesn't have any instances so you can never create instances of nothing, plus it has a whole lot of compiler magic behind it that supports this uh, behavior as a bottom type. So, uh, accepting that this type exists, uh, we can now see uh, what's really going on here. So if we take a look at one of these uh, lines, which does this throw return, uh, th this really is just a throw operation, which is then gonna throw whatever is written down on the line right after it. And we expect that thing usually to be a throwable. Instead, we have a return here. And return in Java, at least, is just a statement. So it's something that's valid to write down on a line. However, in Kotlin, it's also an expression. So it has a uh, return type. And its return type just so happens to be nothing. And so the type checks work out here. Uh, because what we need is for this entire return expression to be a throwable. And it is a throwable, uh, because nothing is a subtype of every other type. And we can keep doing this, uh, so we can uh, put a return in the front of the line again. Uh, this now uh, wants to return the entire expression that follows it. And throw also happens to have a return type, it's also an expression. Its return type is also nothing, just like with return. And what we need here is, of course, something that's of this type of the return type of the function, so int in this case. And does the type check work out? Well, it does. So we need nothing to be an int, which is true. Uh, so this is also valid Kotlin code. Uh, the real question would be, what happens on this line when we run this code? Well, we first have to return the expression that's highlighted on the slide. So in order to return that value, we have to compute it and evaluate it. So we're gonna start doing that. Uh, our next uh, task is to throw something, but again, to throw that thing, we have to compute it. So we're gonna go ahead and run the return statement that's at the end of the line, which just takes us out of the current function entirely. And these two operations that we sort of had in the queue to be executed later, the throw and the return in the front of the line, just never have a chance to run. So 
Uh, you can spam this syntax all that you want, but the only thing that will execute is the very last thing on the line. Which means, of course, that you can sort of just keep doing this and uh, put these keywords all over your code base. Uh, I suggest that if you want to confuse people with, uh, with this, you don't go this far, uh, because it becomes like obviously just bogus. Uh, but if you do just a throw return, or maybe a double return here and there, uh, that can be very confusing and hard to catch. Okay, uh, similarly, uh, this is also valid Kotlin code. Uh, I'm gonna ask again, does anyone know what these light blue things are? Has anyone seen these before? Can anyone tell me what it is? Okay, so these are labels, right? Uh, what do labels do in Kotlin? Uh, well, uh, in this function, uh, they don't have any use yet, but if I uh, put another loop in here, so that we have two nested uh, while loops, we can demonstrate what labels do. So when you have nested loops, if you use uh, statements such as break or continue inside these loops, uh, then that will by default break out or continue at the innermost loop that it's in. However, if you've placed a label on one of the outer loops, which I've in this case uh, called loop, uh, then you can use the syntax break at loop, so you can break out of an outer loop uh, from the inner one. Uh, however, in this function, uh, we didn't have any uh, nested loops or nested lambdas, which uh, labels also work for. So the label that we have placed in front of the while loop is actually useless. And it turns out that so are all of the other labels. So uh, Kotlin's grammar uh, just so happens to allow labels to be placed in the uh, front of every statement and expression in the language uh, for no apparent reason. Um, but uh, we can certainly still use this and uh, have it there at the source level. It's important to point out that these labels can have completely arbitrary names, so you can even use backticks in them and whatever else you want. Uh, but again, if you do things like uh, on this slide, then it will be uh, quite quickly obvious that these must be uh, some silly meaningless thing. But if you use uh, more technical terms, so for example unchecked or partial, then it will seem plausible that these might be something like annotations, which might do something in the language. Uh, fun fact, you can also use soft keywords of the Kotlin language. So if you want to put a cross in line or suspend uh, in the middle of your code, that will be also a great way to scare people. And again, just to recap, uh, this is the same as just not having these labels at all. Uh, finally, a quick example in the spam section is uh, gonna be about nullable uh, values. So we have a function here uh, which is using a nullable string as its parameter, then it's null checking it and using it as a non-null string uh, inside the if check. And we all know that uh, this string might hold a value of null and we have to uh, check for this. But did you also know that you can make these uh, values even more nullable by uh, putting more question marks in there? And you can't just do double question marks, you can do any amount of question marks, it turns out. Uh, and the reason for this is quite complicated, and it relates to how uh, the language defines these nullable types. Uh, but I really encourage you to uh, go and check out uh, this blog post, which is the source for this example, uh, which will explain how nullability works in Kotlin versus uh, other languages such as uh, Swift. Um, oh, and of course these question marks again don't do anything, so uh, this very nullable string is just a regular nullable string. Okay, uh, next section is going to be uh, things that people keep asking for in the language, uh, things that we know from other languages, uh, and a lot of people complain that Kotlin doesn't have them. Uh, the classic example of this, of course, is the ternary operator. Who's missing the ternary operator from Kotlin? Okay, so uh, that's quite a few people. Uh, so the reason why we don't have it, of course, is because we have if-else instead. So if-else is an expression in uh, Kotlin, which means that you can use it for uh, choosing between uh, two values like this. But what if we wanted to implement the ternary operator for ourselves? Uh, this again is sourced from a post that you can uh, find there in the uh, link on the slide. The slides are going to be shared at the end of the talk. Uh, 
Um, so it turns out that we can't implement the ternary operator as it is uh, with the original syntax. We have to make some changes to it. The first change we're going to make is we're uh, going to have to place the question mark in backticks to make it a valid identifier because we don't have this operator in the language, unfortunately. And the second change we're going to make is that we also don't have this uh, colon operator between the two values, so we're going to replace that with a division like this. From here, uh, we can define operators and things that will uh, perform the functions of a ternary operator. So we're going to start with the two values that we're going to group together in something that we're going to call a ternary of t, uh, which really is just going to be a type alias for a pair of t uh, with another t. So it's just a uh, very simple data class which is able to hold uh, two values of the same generic type. Then uh, we need to create these instances with a division. So we're going to define this uh, completely generic division operator that you can write down between any two values of the same type. And uh, this will uh, create a pair that will store these two values for us. Afterwards, uh, we just have to select uh, one of these values and do the uh, question mark part of the operator uh, between a Boolean and one of these uh, pairs of values. So for that, we're going to use uh, features that we've already seen an infix function, uh, which has a name in backticks, it extends boolean and it takes the pair of values as its parameter. And inside it, all we do is we check the value of the boolean, and if it's true, we return the first value, and if it's false, we return the second value. As simple as that. So uh, this is uh, something that sort of looks like a ternary operator, uh, but it's actually not very much a ternary operator, uh, because it doesn't work the same way. So the problem with this uh, implementation, other than it being a bit ugly, is uh, that it first computes both of the values on the two sides of the division, stores the result of both of those branches, and then we just select uh, which one to return. Uh, but if we use a regular uh, if-else or uh, a ternary operator in another language, then that will only run the branch that's required by uh, the value of the boolean uh, at the front of the expression. So we want this lazy valuation, ideally. And if you want to keep going with this implementation, you can actually add that lazy behavior back in as well. But then you're going to have to start wrapping things in lambdas. So uh, it's just looking uglier and uglier at this point, uh, where we have this if-else in the language, uh, which is suddenly looking quite appealing, I think. Um, so this ternary is something you can do. If you want this lazy lambda implementation, it's like homework and you can have fun with it. Um, you can certainly do it. It's quite simple based off the uh, previous one, but, um, you know, like diminishing returns after a while. Uh, something else that people uh, like asking for is collection literals. So uh, we have these collection factory functions in the standard library, which I think are quite concise and easy to create collections with. But there are other, uh, even more concise languages, which allow you to create arrays or lists uh, with this syntax with just uh, square brackets and then listing all the elements inside it. Uh, this again is something that we can't implement in this form in Kotlin, so like bad news first. Uh, but if uh, you allow me to add just one character in here, uh, then we can make this syntax work for uh, creating this list. So uh, the real question here is, how do we do these uh, square brackets in Kotlin? Well, we actually use them all the time already. So whenever you're, uh, right. uh, whenever you're uh, indexing a list, you're using these square brackets. Whenever you're uh, getting a value from a map based off of a key, uh, you use these square brackets. And also, if you have like, more custom types, like a matrix, for example, uh, that has multiple uh, indices, you can uh, pass those in with uh, this syntax as well. So uh, this really is just an, another operator in the language, which is called get. And what we want to do here is instead of accepting one or two values, uh, like in those more classic example, is we want to accept any amount of values, which we can do by using a var arg uh, and a generic one. And then all we're going to do is take all of those values and put them in a list like this. The final question is, uh, what are we calling this get operator on? What is this thing that's called L? And whenever you need to uh, introduce a new valid identifier in your Kotlin code, the easiest way to do it is to create an object that has that name. Uh, 
So from there on, you can just write down that identifier and it will be valid code. So we can quite easily just put this getter uh, or this get operator rather inside an object and we've achieved the syntax uh, that we have on the top. And if you like this syntax, you can uh, keep going. You can create sets with this. You can create maps with similar syntax and so on. Uh, I'm not sure how useful this is, but if you want to do this, you certainly can. Okay, um, so uh, for our next example here, uh, you're gonna have to imagine that you're an Android developer, uh, which should be like quite easy, uh, hopefully. And uh, this is a story of a colleague who was uh, working on a retrofit-based API. This is something we know and love and we're used to, but then uh, he had to uh, work with the backend of this same project, which was, it, which was written in Spring. So the backend code looked something like this. So uh, this gets bonus points for looking somewhat similar. Uh, it has a class that corresponds to this API. It has the same sorts of uh, functions. But one thing that was really bugging my colleague is that the annotations were all weird, right? So we're used to these get annotations and the path annotation and things like that in retrofit. But then Spring went ahead and introduced all these weird things which are a lot longer and just different and new and like you don't want to learn new things, obviously. So uh, he started thinking and he was like, what if I could still use Spring, but uh, instead of using their annotations, I could use the same syntax that I'm already used to from writing retrofit code on the client side. And the good news is that this is quite easy to implement in Kotlin. All you need uh, for uh, this to work with Spring is introduce a bunch of type aliases. So uh, type aliases are great because they don't introduce new types, uh, actual new types in the language. They just give you new names for existing types. So we can just uh, create these names that correspond to the original annotations, use them in our code, and then by the time that it compiles, uh, in the compiled code, we're gonna see the original uh, Spring annotations, so the Spring framework is gonna be able to uh, work with this uh, controller, even though the annotations are uh, visually quite different than what's uh, the usual solution in Spring. And with that, of course, uh, we've solved this problem, and we had like completely identical code on both sides of this API. <coughs> Okay, um, so I've been talking about like silly things for about half an hour at this point, and uh, there's something that uh, we didn't get to yet, which is like high time that we did, <coughs> which would be JavaScript. So uh, not only am I gonna talk about JavaScript, I'm gonna talk about the JavaScript type system, uh, so-called, uh, which has this notion of truthy and falsy values. So, um, this starts off easy, so for example, true is considered truthy in JavaScript, and false is considered falsy, uh, but then every other value is either truthy or falsy as well. So for example, any non-zero number would be truthy, and zero alone would be falsy. And this goes on, so for example, for strings, a string with a space in it is truthy, and an empty string is falsy, and it's, it gets weirder and weirder with um, arrays and objects and uh, kinds like that. So, uh, why is there this distinction between truthy and true, for example? Well, if we compare uh, two values that are truthy with uh, double equals in JavaScript, then that comparison will pass. So this is only comparing the values, but not checking their types. If we do triple equals, uh, that will give us a type comparison, so this would fail in JavaScript. Uh, but what if we wanted to use triple equals in this comparison and want to make it pass? How can we convert uh, these types? Well, as far as I know, the idiomatic way to do this in JavaScript, uh, which is an interesting uh, turn of phrase to say, uh, is to do, this, do these uh, double bangs in front of the uh, non-Boolean value. So this double bang operator in JavaScript converts any value to either true or false with the Boolean type, and uh, keep its truthiness value. And this will, of course, uh, pass because they are now both Booleans. So, uh, how does this work and can we do this in Kotlin? Uh, this is gonna be a success story for once, we don't have to change this syntax at all. Uh, so, all we need to do is implement a single uh, bang of these two, uh, 
So if we uh, use that to convert our uh, int to a boolean, then the next uh, not operator in the very front will just be the regular not operator uh, on a boolean. So what we really need to do is uh, define the not operator on int, uh, which of course if you're if you're already using for factorials at this point you would have to like uh, put in different packages or something. Um, and make this operator invert the value while also converting it to a boolean. So we would only return true here if the integer was zero. And then uh, from here on out, we can use these double bangs in Kotlin as well with the exact same syntax as in JavaScript and use it to convert uh, integers to booleans. Uh, you can also, of course, go ahead and define this kind of operator for strings and objects and lists and whatever you want to define it for. Um, next example, we're going to just take a list of names here, and we have this code here that filters for the ones that are starting with an E. So uh, this is idiomatic Kotlin, uh, which I'm like sorry for in this talk, I guess. Um, and because it's using this very concise lambda expression, it's using a standard library function, it's very easy to read. Uh, but we can certainly make this worse. So uh, we can put these parentheses back around the parameter list, which are uh, usually not required. We can also name the incoming parameter of the function uh, if we want to. And we can, of course, uh, even type the incoming parameter explicitly. So this is a bit more verbose, which is something. Um, but um, we're talking JavaScript. So how does JavaScript do these things? Well, for a while now, uh, even JavaScript has had uh, lambdas in uh, some way, shape, or form. Uh, but before they had lambdas, they were already doing a lot of functional things like this. So instead of lambdas, uh, what JavaScript was doing, and there's a lot of JavaScript code like this out there, uh, they were declaring functions with just the regular function keyword right there uh, when calling the uh, function that they wanted to uh, pass it in as a parameter to. And it turns out that you can also do this in Kotlin, uh, which is probably not a very well-known uh, feature. So instead of using a lambda in Kotlin, you can uh, define a function with the fun keyword, uh, give it a regular parameter list, even have a return type, uh, which is something that you can uh, not write down in a lambda uh, with any syntax. And uh, the other change that happens if you use this is that you now need to use the return keyword inside the function explicitly instead of uh, the behavior that we have in lambdas where the uh, last value that's in the lambda is just implicitly returned, which of course uh, some people uh, dislike uh, quite a bit. Okay, uh, so for the last section, we're just gonna do straight up puzzlers of weird things that you can do. Um, here's a data class which is uh, meant to contain a message and all it has inside it is a body. And then we have two instances of this class in a list. Uh, which say two different uh, things. So uh, if I loop through these uh, messages now and print each of them, uh, what are we expecting to see on the output? Uh, anyone? Uh, what, what, what do we see printed here? Th this is not tricky yet. Okay, so this is what we see, right? Uh, so what I'm printing is instances of the message class, uh, which is a data class. So uh, it's going to be converted to a string using its toString function. And the toString function of a data class contains its name and each of its uh, properties and their current values. Uh, so what if I just introduce these uh, very boring looking parentheses around the incoming parameter of a lambda? Uh, this is very conventional syntax in many languages. Usually when we put expressions in parentheses, it doesn't do anything. So uh, what does this do in this case? Uh, it turns out that it changes the output entirely. So now we're uh, getting the uh, bodies of the messages instead of the uh, two string of the entire message class. So to explain this, we're gonna have to do to a, we're gonna have to go to a slightly uh, more complex example where uh, things will become more obvious. So let's take a person class, which has two properties, a name and an age. And if we create an instance of this, uh, we can use this structuring declarations to get these two values out of the class, right? So uh, we can uh, declare a name and an age variable at the same time, and then uh, assign values to them 
from the properties of the data class. Just a moment. <clears throat> right. And uh, these variables uh, don't need to be named the same way that the properties in the data class are. They can have any name at all. They can even have the same names as the uh, properties of the data class. But if you mix up the order, uh, they're going to be still positional. So in this case, age would become a string and name would become an int. So they would get all mixed up. So it's a good idea to uh, keep things uh, sort of the same as in the data class originally. So after destructuring, we can of course print these values. Uh, we can do something like this. And if we do this for a list of uh, objects of this type, then uh, we can do a for each over it. And by default, we would uh, take this incoming parameter. And if we wanted to print the name and age of everyone, uh, we would have to uh, use this longer syntax of person.name, person.age for each of these values which would of course work uh, like we expected to, but we can also uh, do something different. We can uh, use this structuring within lambdas as well. So uh, we can immediately deconstruct the person objects that are uh, coming into the lambda into their name and age and have a, a much easier uh, time of working with them inside the lambda. And so what we really need to focus on here is this syntax, so the parentheses in the start of the lambda will signify destructuring, which is sort of uh, obvious with two values, perhaps. Uh, even this can be missed quite easily. But if you do this for a data class which just has a single member, then the difference between writing down, the, uh, writing down just a name for the class and putting it in parentheses will be that it's being destructured and its single property is being read into this new variable. Uh, next up, a uh, short example of generics. So I have a processor of t's here, and all it's able to do is it's able to process values of t. Uh, quite simple. Uh, I can create an instance of this. I can create, for example, a processor of ints if I want to pr process integers, and hooray, it's able to process integers. Uh, but, it, but then if we try different values, for example, a string, it turns out that it's also able to process strings, which is, of course, not what I would want to do. Uh, why is this possible? Uh, well, my problem is too much generics in the class. So if we change the class ever so slightly uh, and remove the uh, generics declaration uh, that's in front of the process function, then suddenly the line with the string uh, shows me an error. So the problem here was that I was uh, placing a generic parameter in front of the function, which you are uh, completely allowed to name the same way that uh, a uh, class level uh, generic type parameter is named. You get no warnings for this whatsoever, by the way. Um, and in this case, every call of the process function uh, can use a different substitution for this parameter. So this process function can be called with any object whatsoever, uh, while uh, regardless of what the type parameter of the class that contains it was. Uh, but if we remove this, then this t now refers to the class level parameter and, you know, we get the warning and everything. Okay, uh, very last example to wrap things up with. Uh, I think this is quite a good one. Uh, I'll give you like 10 seconds to try to uh, figure out what this code does. Uh, this is valid code, it compiles, it runs, and you don't need like any uh, tricky code in front of it to support it. Okay, uh, so uh, looking at this, uh, what can we decipher? Um, so these parts, uh, what's happening here is that we're declaring a lambda, and then we're immediately invoking it with a value. So this is easy enough, perhaps, but then uh, things are quite weird inside the lambda. So uh, where we expect a value to be, uh, there's just string, the name of a type, and also we're calling this uh, lambda with another name that's just a type name. So uh, in a normal lambda, uh, for example, like this, which just doubles a number, uh, we expect values to be here, uh, like expressions that have, have some value. So, uh, in order, order to understand what the code up top does, uh, 
uh, let's talk a bit about uh, companion objects. So when we write down code like this, uh, we print int max value, uh, we expect, uh, we, we know that uh, this value, uh, which looks like a static value, will come from the companion object of the class. So int has a companion object, and inside it there is this uh, property, which is called max value, and we learn that uh, things inside the companion object can be accessed with this static looking syntax. Uh, but why is this? Uh, so if we take a regular class and just put a whole bunch of objects inside it, then for each of these objects uh, we can uh, use the functionality inside it with this syntax. So for example, for object B we can go sumclass.b and then call a function on it uh, that's inside that object. But if we uh, mark one of these objects as a companion, we also get this additional syntax for using that same object, which is just the name of the class, and then every function is accessible uh, with uh, just writing down the name immediately, skipping the name of the object. So the reason why the first thing works is that writing down just some class.a, for example, refers to the uh, instance of the objects that uh, nested inside the class, and it turns out that the first line on the right hand side works the exact same way. So just writing down the name of a class that has a companion object is already referring to the companion object, uh, the instance of that companion object that's inside the class. And of course uh, you can even uh, drop the name of a companion object. We, most of the time we don't give these explicit, explicit names. And if you do that then it's name under the hood which you probably won't use because you have shorter syntax uh, available to you, would be uh, companion. So back to the previous example, uh, when we write down int.maxValue, the way that the reason why we can read things from the companion object is because writing down just int, the name of the type, is already the instance of the companion which is being fetched for us. And that's of course the same thing that we're using in this puzzler up here. So the parameter that's being passed into this lambda is the companion object of the int class and the thing that we are returning from it is just the companion of the string class. So if there are any um, values in the string class which I think there are some like character set constants or something in there, uh, you could access those uh, via the variable that uh, we are assigning the result to, so via a. Um, because it's of the type string.companion. And that's all that I wanted to cover today. Uh, I have a lot of sources which I already uh, mentioned were on the bottom of the slides, so I encourage you to uh, go and check all of these out. And you can find all of these slides uh, right there on my uh, website, and I've also tweeted them about a minute ago. Uh, so uh, you can uh, find me on there too. And I'm going to leave that up for just a moment. Okay. Uh, and if you have any questions about anything you've seen here, I'm very happy to take those. I think we have time for them. Any questions? <clears throat> yeah, if you have an interface or something and you make a companion object in that interface that implements that interface, you can call it as, uh, so I, my service is the interface and I make a companion object inside it, implement that interface, I can actually call my service and do things. Is yeah. that good or bad? Because it's like a singleton instance of your interface, but you can swap it out with it under. <coughs> Okay, so the question is, uh, you have an interface, you put a companion object inside it which also implements that interface, and then, uh, is this valid syntax? Can anyone, like, do, you, do we know that this is valid? Can you put a companion? Okay. It's like a way to make a singleton object, because it's a companion object, yeah. but you can swap it out with another implementation if you want. Yeah, so in that case, uh, you could use just the name of the interface as its like default implementation if you wanted. Um, can you do that? I guess you can. Should you? Uh, yeah, that's my question. I know I can, but should I? <laughs> Hard to tell. I, I, I'm not here to tell you what you, what you should do. You should uh, ask someone else about this. <laughs> <laughs>
it, it, it depends on the API. Like, if, if it seems reasonable to you uh, when you're using it, like, why not? Anyone else? Okay, so I think that's it then. Uh, you can find me around if you like stickers. Uh, I have a whole bunch of these to give out. And uh, thank you for your time. <laughs>